Hi, everyone. I'm Jaleel Sobers, and today I'm with Patrick Tatum, the head coach of McMaster University's men's basketball team. Thank you so much for joining me today, Patrick. Uh, I appreciate you having me. I'm, I'm, I'm just blessed you even uh, asked me to do this. So thank you for having me, Jaleel. Thank you. A question I like to start with is, who is Patrick Tatum? Ha. Who is Patrick Tatum? Patrick Tatum is a uh, humble, uh, giving, um, hard, hardworking uh, uh, minority coach in Canada. Uh, I, I feel like uh, uh, over the last eight years in Canada, just in U Sport alone, you just even including Mac, um, there's been a number of uh, young black coaches that have been hired to coach men's basketball at a, at different university or different institutions. So um, I'm, I'm very grateful and uh, blessed to be able to do that. But I'm also a a family man. I'm also a a, a husband, a father, a son. Um, I mean, I think the list goes on. But uh, I think a few of the things that I listed off right off right off the right off the bat are are things that are very uh, important to me and you mentioned that you're a minority coach does that does um does being black have a lot to do with who you are uh you know what i i think it does i think uh any any black person in north america um being black has something to do with everything you do on an, on an everyday basis right i mean um from the time i was i don't know eight or nine years old, my mom taught me about uh, hard work and what you had to do in order for you to be able to survive in Canada or just this North America or even the world. So uh, for me, I think uh, being black uh, is, is I wear it on my sleeve and I'm, I'm proud of it. And I, I just know that I always have to work extremely hard, especially in the profession that I'm in. And what did your mom teach you about being black? Does it come with disadvantages, do you think, or advantages? Yeah, you know, I mean, it's just, I mean, just like you see what's going on today in the world, I mean, there's a lot of uh, social injustices, and uh, I think uh, I didn't really understand it back in the day, but uh, it's, it's, it's come more and more to light um, as I graduated university, and now I'm, I'm a young adult. I'd like to think I'm a young adult at least. <laughs> um, now I'm a young adult trying to teach some of my young uh, student athletes, my young black student athletes that like, you know, it's, it's, it's important to have a degree. It's important to have a piece of paper to say that you're a young educated black man. It's important for you to um, work extra hard so that you can uh, essentially have um, a fair advantage at certain positions in uh, the corporate world or even in coaching. So. Uh, yeah, there are definitely disadvantages, and I do think that uh, my mom prepared myself and my two sisters uh, fairly well for uh, what's going on right now in the world. And a few weeks ago, you posted that um, the applied programs in high schools um, are a hindrance to kids getting uh, degrees and making it to college. Can you explain why that is and why kids should stay away from entering applied programs when they first get to high school? Yeah, you know, one of the things I think that's really important is that, uh, you know, it's been going on in, in Canada for a while, I think, as, at least in the, in the secondary uh, school board system, uh, which is streaming, right? Like, uh, we, we always have this this uh, this box beside our name that, oh, this is a young black person. Oh, they came from this neighborhood. They came right. from, or they're part of this demographic. So uh, maybe we should put him or her into applied courses. Uh, just, you know, so that they can keep up. It's not really said. It's not very, uh, what do you call it, overt. It's very covert. Uh, but um, I do think that it's, it's today's, in today's world, a lot of young people are now understanding uh, the pieces to systemic racism, the pieces to overt and covert racism, the pieces to uh, microaggressions, right? And I think that uh, uh, in in the school system specifically, uh, streaming is a is a huge thing. And I think uh, if you if you look at Peel Board school uh, system in 
in the Brampton, Mississauga area, uh, they've, they've been really, really penalizing uh, teachers and schools on streaming young black kids and basically directing them to go the college route rather than giving them a fair chance to play at the university or even study at the university level, right? Um, and I, I don't know, I just, that's part of what I, why I like enjoy what I'm doing right now at Mac because it's a very highly academic uh, university, McMaster University. And uh, my, my team is made up of, of uh, like, it's probably 90% minorities. Um, pretty much people that, uh, whether they look like me or, or they're from a different uh, walk of life, I think 90% uh, of my team is a minority uh, of minority descent and, uh, or demographic. And I just want all of them to know that, you know, it's not, it's not easy getting into Mac, but you are here now. Let's play basketball, but also gain a degree while we're here at the same time. And, and it's it's a it's a family thing, but it's also a a business thing as well. And on your journeys throughout the world and throughout your life playing basketball, did you experience any overt or covert racism? <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, here and there. I mean, playing basketball growing up. Uh, um, I mean, you you you. You don't, you don't witness it as much growing up in Canada, but I was fortunate enough to play on AAU programs or um, OBA programs where we actually got to go to the States. And now we're talking about going to Detroit, Michigan, or we're talking about going to Cleveland, Ohio, or we're talking about going to Indianapolis, Indiana, and, um, or even uh, Kentucky, Lexington, Kentucky, all four places I've gone to to play basketball when I was in high school. Uh, we we ran into different scenarios as young young teenagers of uh, just outright racism, right? Like, oh, we can't stay at this house, um, or we can't stay at this whole hotel because we are a certain color, right? So for me, it's I've seen it and I've witnessed it, and I, I know some of the younger generations right now that that are going that are witnessing what's going on. Um, in the world, they, they probably haven't really uh, been through it, but um, I mean, you just pick up your phone, you look online now, and you can kind of witness anything and everything just by uh, scrolling or, or typing something into Google. And when you experience those, you can't stay here because of your skin color. Being a basketball player comes with a lot of confidence and I don't want to say arrogance, but what was it like for your, um, for your confidence to hear that because of your skin color, you couldn't stay in a certain establishment. Yeah, I just uh, you know what the the one of the things I feel like, especially in some of the uh, places that I named off to you, I mean, they're they're very very much so segregated areas, right? Like you have both Detroit and Cleveland, which, which are considered mm, not very attractive cities right. yeah um, they do have their certain areas that are considered hoods but then they also have their very uh conservative areas that are very uh uh rich and affluent if you will so like for us going being able to play basketball in those two different cities um you might play at a at a arena that's very very nice and you're trying to stay in the local area that's really nice and it's it's somewhat uppity and uh, you get to the hotel and it's like mm, just 10 miles down the road there's another hotel down there that might be a little bit better for you guys you know and it's uh, uh in in some scenarios it's it's overt in some scenarios it's very like ah uh, you know what our prices are pretty steep and uh, we don't really have many rooms left and we have a couple of reservations. So you're going to have to wait for a cancellation to happen. And then it's like, Oh, okay, well wait, no, sorry. There's just no room. Right. So uh, for us and for myself, back when I played basketball in high school, it was, it was something that we just never really understood. And uh, you know, I, I don't know. I think many people, I guess you can say we thank, listening to uh, hip hop or rap and you're just like, oh, 
when you're up in Canada, you're listening to some of the hip hop and the rap that's happening in the States. And you're like, oh, oh, that makes more sense now. Now I understand what I just went through uh, a month ago or, or four weeks ago. So, uh, and then when you get out to Kentucky or Indianapolis, it's, it's a different story. It's a, it's straight up like, no, you're not staying here. Like this is not for your kind. So uh, it, it was difficult, man. It was very difficult. And trust me, when I was 14, 15, didn't really understand. And my parents kind of talked to myself and my sisters about it a little bit more. And then as I got older and I went off to school, um, I was a little bit more aware and I just kind of understood way more. Um, at that time I was probably 19 or 20 years old. So, yeah. And what was your upbringing like? Where, where were you raised? Ah, uh, uh, grew up in, uh, Scarborough, Ontario. Um, actually Malvern to be exact, no, uh, around that Nelson Finch area. Um, uh, right on Crow trail. Uh, I mean, just a standard life. You know, my parents, they worked, whether it be one or two jobs and my, both my parents, uh, neither one of them graduated from university, uh, but found a way to kind of, you know, just put food on our food on the table and clothes on our back. Um, and uh, uh, we grew up in government housing. Uh, so, I mean, it's go out to your cousin's house, entire family trip, come back late at night, 11 o'clock, lights are all out flick the light switch and you see cockroaches just scouring around the house, just leaving to, to go back in the shade. So uh, I grew up a different way um, back when I was younger. And I'm, but it, I'm also grateful for it because it, it's kind of made me uh, or shaped me into who I am now, which is a hardworking uh, young man that just loves to give. And I'll, I'd give the t-shirt off my back to anybody that needed it. So uh, I'm just thankful for my upbringing really. So when you grew up in Malvern, what schools did you go to? I went to um, I went to Tom Longboat, which was my elementary school. I ran track there for a couple of years, advocated for us to get basketball when I was in grade five or six, um, and then ended up going on to middle school at uh, Dr. Marion Hilliard, right across from oh, Malvern County. Oh yeah, I never knew that. Yeah. <laughs> I uh, did two years there, played basketball for one out of the two years because my mom kept me off of basketball for one year due to my grades. And then um, I did one year at Lester B. Pearson, which was attached to uh, Dr. Mary and Hilliard. Both were kind of just like, you know, you transition right from the junior, I should say the junior high school or the middle school. Yeah, it's right like a door the- that connects it, right? Yeah. So you just transition right there. And then um, uh, we moved in 2000 which was myself going into the 10th grade. Uh, we moved in 2000 to, uh, to Brampton. Uh, just, you know, parents um, ha- couldn't stay any longer in Scarborough and rightfully so. Uh, myself, I was getting into some trouble and uh, my parents were like, no, this isn't the way we're going, you know? And my, both my parents are immigrants to Canada, right? So uh, coming up from Jamaica, they're just like, we, we got to find a way to make sure that uh, we do what we need to do so that our kids benefit from uh, whatever whatever work we put in. So um, as soon as I started to get in trouble in grade six, seven, my parents were like, no, we're out. And <laughs> moved out to uh, Brampton, which felt like it was nothing at the time. And now Brampton's completely built up. I mean, they're, they're even building it all the way out to Georgetown and Caledon. So, uh, yeah. And then I moved out to Brampton and became a student at Chinkuzi Secondary for four, three, 10, 11, 12, 13. So, yeah, four years. And then ended up getting a scholarship to uh, Cleveland State University. So when you first played basketball, it wasn't in school. It was outside of school? Yeah, good question. Uh, th- yeah, absolutely. It, I never actually ended up playing, like, organized basketball in school. Actually... Um, you, you wouldn't know this, but I got into some trouble in, in grade six, um, with myself and a couple of friends. Uh, we did some mischievous stuff back in the day and, uh, we actually had to do some like community service to repay our debt. Um, so my community service I did at Lester B. Harrison and it was just like simply like basketball clinic. Like I had to just do hours and hours just sitting around helping out at a basketball clinic and, um, 
Um, I kind of just played basketball like while there was a transition between one group to the next. And then this man was like, hey, you play basketball? I'm like, no, I'm, I, I wish I could though. And he's like, okay, come here, come to this place on Saturday. And, and the rest was history. Never, ever stopped organized basketball until I was like 26 or 27 years old. And who was the guy that told you to come play basketball? Uh, this guy, uh, two guys. His na- one guy's name was uh, Rudy Bricker, uh, and another guy's name was uh, Mike Cummings. Both, uh, both guys that had an organization called the Scrubber Hurricanes. So, um, I mean, I love them to death. To this day, I still talk to Mike Cummings, and uh, I talk to Rudy, Rudy's son, Andre. Um, to this day. So I'm very thankful I, I, they, they, they approached me. And uh, yeah, I, I don't know where I'd be without basketball right now. What would you be doing, though, if you hadn't moved from Malvern? What do you think? If I hadn't, been, if I hadn't moved, uh, man. Would you have graduated I, from Pearson? Uh, 100% would have graduated only because my parents were, my, my mom was super, super strict. She was all about the academics and my dad was all about the sports. So I had a very good mixture between the two. And, uh, you know, uh, I think in many cases, um, I think I was very fortunate because I had a two parent household. Um, a lot of my other friends back when I was in grade six, seven, eight came from one parent households. Right. So, um, uh, I think I had that that really good foundation uh, that helped me to uh, uh, get to where I am today. But if, even even if I had not moved out of Melbourne, I think I would have still graduated from high school. I think I would have ended up going to maybe a college, maybe a university. Again, my mom was super strict on the academics, so she was always preaching like, "You guys need to start working soon and taking care of your grades because when you're done high school, it's straight." straight to university you're not gonna not graduate and not and then be like my father be like your father and your mother so um, uh, yeah was there any um temptation to go to a better basketball school than mother Teresa instead of pearson yeah i mean you know what uh jaleel i really 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 wanted to go to uh Mother Teresa, and I ended up going to Paris, and, and then my parents moved us all the way up to Brampton, and I was like, no! And I begged my parents to uh, send me to Mother Teresa because I really wanted to be a part of that, uh, the basketball team with your brother and Jamie and a whole bunch of different guys. Um, uh, but my parents were just like, ah. Uh, and then I ended up meeting a coach, and he was just like, you don't need to go anywhere. Just simply play where you need to play and people will find you. If you're good enough, people will find you. And, and so be it. Like, that's what happened. I played and I was good enough and people will start to find me. So I was very fortunate. And how did they find you? What was your recruitment like? Uh, recruitment was interesting. I, I, uh, I actually uh, I, uh, played a couple camps. I did a couple camps in the States with uh, – um, a team or a couple people from downtown Toronto from Regent Park area. And then uh, that helped me to gain some confidence and play with like uh, MDP camps and provincial teams. Um, again, your brother was along, along the way the entire time. Um, and then we were very fortunate enough to play uh, our junior national team in 2001, I want to say it was, where we went to, we went to uh, Venezuela. Um, and again, at that time in 2001, I was in grade 11, my recruitment was very like, it was good, but it wasn't like very active. Like I had an interest, but not like much like, Hey, we want you to come to our school. So, um, it was good. It was great. It was, it was exactly what I needed to have. And, uh, um, over, over, uh, the next year or two, 2002 and 2003, it really picked up. I was able to play AAU with, uh, Coach Ro Russell and Wayne Dawkins, um, um, somebody you actually interviewed, yeah. um, uh, uh, from those those two years, just absolutely kind of catapulted me to the NCAA. So, yeah, it's was slow. There, but it's was there a point that you knew that you can get a basketball scholarship? 
Yeah, I, I honestly did not know about it until grade 12. Like, and I wish I knew a little bit more prior to, but uh, uh, it wasn't until grade 12 where I was like, whoa, I can actually get a scholarship? This is ridiculous. And then I really just had to p pick it up and like put in as many hours as I could into the gym. So um, again, I credit a lot to my parents because they would take me wherever I needed to get to in order for me to get better. And if they couldn't take me, then I would just take the bus myself. Um, and I also credit a ton to uh, Coach Dawkins and Coach Russell because uh, both of those guys put in some hours, uh, not just with me, but with a lot of kids. Um, between the two of them, easily have sent over 350 kids from the Toronto area to uh, junior college, Division Three, Division Two, NAI, Division One. Um, so I'm definitely grateful to those to those two for the rest of my life. And you mentioned your parents. Do you think that um, our generation and younger children understand the sacrifice that our parents made moving countries and having kids in, and when the time comes, moving them out of a about to be dangerous area at any, at any cost to a different, safer area? Um. Do I think it, do I think my parents, I missed the last bit of it. Do you think that um, young people understand the sacrifice that, that oh. our parents had to make? You know what, I don't, it's, it's so hard to understand that sacrifice until you actually get to uh, university or you're at least the young adult, right? Like when you're, anywhere between 14 and 18 years old, you might not really understand it because you're kind of into yourself and you're kind of doing your thing. Um, and it's not until you're somewhat humbled or you go through some hard times or you learn a little bit about yourself and about where you are um, and you're comfortable with where you are, then you start to understand like, you know what? My parents did something real for me, right? And um, when I was in university, I, I, I I was always, always, always grateful for the fact that my parents uh, did whatever they could to help me along my basketball journey. But I was also grateful for a lot of the coaches that helped me along the way. Um, it wasn't until I, got, I graduated from university, came home, I'm about to leave to go overseas, and I just sat down with like uh, my friend Kaylin and my friend Janelle, and we, we spoke to uh, my parents one day, just like having a barbecue, just chilling, hanging out. Like, you know what? what was your, like, how did you guys get to Canada? And they told us the craziest story. And we're like, what? You guys lived under a different alias for a whole two years before you could actually be called your normal name? Like, this is ridiculous. My mom was cleaning toilets and hotel rooms for a year and a half before she actually was able to work a real job. And then she was able to go to like a, um, like a, a specialty school where she can actually get an administrative um, uh, credentials. So uh, it's not, it wasn't until like 21, 22 when I really understood like, whoa, my parents did some serious things for not just me, but my, my sisters and, and for themselves. They sacrificed a lot. And uh, um, I, I'm, I wish I had a million bucks because I'd give them half of it. <laughs> um, you're, six, you're six foot seven. So were you always taller than other? every other kid or, or was it a growth spurt that happened? Yeah, I was, I was always tall. Fortunate for me, I've been, uh, the, the, I've been the tall guy in the back row when it was uh, school day pictures with my class. Um, uh, I've been the Christmas tree um, <laughs> when I was in elementary school. Uh, I mean, you name it. I've been the tallest person in my class um, year after year. And uh, it wasn't until I actually got to, university when I was like, whoa, there's 6'9", there's 6'10", there's 7 feet. So uh, I'm, uh, I've always been tall. What was um, the reason that you chose Cleveland State? Huh. Again, I honestly did not know this until I'm like, I'm now thinking back to it. Um, I, uh, Funny story. I um I initially committed to St. Bonaventure. Oh wow! Never knew. Then they had some sort of scandal that took place there. So I I 
was able to get a decommit um, and get some papers to say that I'm not going there through the NCAA, um, but I got it in late April. So essentially the, the signing period, there was about four days left in the signing period. And I had already met this coach that was coaching at Michigan State. And he said he was out of scholarship. So he's not, there's no chance I can go to Michigan State, but he said to hold Hank tight. Two days later, he calls back and says, I got the job at Cleveland State. Would you like to come? And I was just like, I love this guy. He's cool. And I said, Coach, I want to go on. I want to go on three visits, and then I'll make a decision. So I went to Cleveland State, I went to Central Michigan, and I went to Richmond. And of the three schools that I went to, I came back home, told Coach Dawkins, I want to go to Central Michigan. Central Michigan had just won the MAC tournament. They had just went to the NCAA tournament. I think they got to the round of 64, maybe the Sweet 16, with Chris Kamen, who ended up getting drafted that year. So for me, I was just like, wow, this is a school that's going to help propel me to the NBA. Um, and uh, Coach Dawkins sat down, and my mom, my dad, me, none of us had ever been through this, sat us down and said, Pat, sounds like a great idea. It sounds like a good school. I know you were happy from your visit. But I went to Eastern Michigan. When I was at Eastern Michigan, I wanted to gouge my eyes out. I hated Michigan. And not to say that you'll hate Central Michigan, but I think I hated it more because I didn't really have a coach that had my back. I didn't have a coach that looked identified like me. And that kind of clicked at the time. And I but I didn't really get it at the time. So then I was like, well, I guess it's, Cleveland State, because that coach was the only black coach out of the three schools that was recruiting me. So I was just like, it's like you're going you're gonna to like it in the long run. So I decided that I was going to go to Cleveland State. And I also loved their visit, but I just was really fixated on the NBA piece with Central Michigan. And fortunate for me, they never ended up going back to the NCAA tournament for the four years that I played at uh, Cleveland State. And um, uh, it, it, it was the best move for me because to this day, I'm still in contact with uh, – my uh, my Cleveland State head coach, who's now coaching back at Michigan State. So, so what would have happened if you had went to Central Michigan, or did you ever consider Richmond? I loved Richmond, but uh, I just didn't consider it as much because it was a little further away from from home. And uh, I don't know. I think my parents really wanted to be able to come out and watch games and travel. And uh, I think Michigan and Cleveland were the two closest schools for me. Um, um, I don't, uh, I don't really know what would have ever happened with Central Michigan because I kind of moved on, but we did end up playing them um, a year later. Uh, thankfully, we beat them two times in a row. Um, and uh, um, uh, yeah, I, I, the coach was cool. He was cool. I ended up playing against him in my senior year. He ended up moving to Detroit. So uh he, he coached at the University of Detroit, and uh, he was cool, but nothing could ever, ever, ever replace what I had with my head coach and the staff at Cleveland State. Um, I was very, very fortunate to be coached by two different coaching staff, but both coaches, both head coaches were uh, minority coaches, black coaches that came in and, you know, uh, just, you know, just taught, taught me a lot about being su successful, um, taught me a lot about um, really – embracing uh, who I am and my color and um, also leaning on God and just understanding a few things about um, my religion, right? So uh, I, I wouldn't trade it in for the world, man. I, I love both the coaches that I played for at Cleveland State. And even though we weren't the greatest, uh, I think I, I took so many more things from uh, the program and the coaches more than I did for basketball. Um, what was your first impression of the NCAA once you got to college? Oh, oh my gosh, man. I thought that thing was hard. I thought it was hard. <laughs> and my first day at Cleveland State, my parents drove us, drove me down. They dropped me off in the dorms. We had a meet and greet literally right next door at a pizza shop with all the first year guys, which was about five of us. 
and the coach walked in. He's like, man, you guys are going to be best friends, this and that, that and this. You guys are going to spend the next four years together. So you guys are a group. Um, and then uh, say goodbye to your parents. Cause we're about to run you guys into the ground. And literally four hours later, after eating pizza, <laughs> get on the line. Let's go. We're running. And after we're done running, we're going to go lift. Man, I never saw, I never seen so many guys throw up. Um, and that was my first day on camp. That was my first full day. I was like, what the heck? After like the first week, I was just like, I don't know if I can do this. But, uh, you know, my, that was a dream of mine, man. So I just plugged away and kept going, kept going. And it just started to become like a natural thing. It, it felt good, right? And um, over time, I just stopped coming home. <laughs> until I graduated so it was great was there anybody that kept you focused while you were down there somebody from Canada or somebody from Cleveland you know, you know what um I gotta credit some of that to some of my teammates right I had a couple teammates that were international so a couple of the guys that took me out on my visit were both um international guys both one from Senegal one from France um both of African descent um uh, and then there was another French guy on the team who's, again, of African descent. So between the four of us, we were all international guys. So it made it a little bit easier because they could relate or I could relate to them because they've been over in the USA missing their families that are basically across the world. So um, anything they did, I got to do with them. And they were all third and fourth year guys. So um, the transition was was pretty seamless um, after maybe week two or three. And do you remember the hardest day on campus that you ever had? Hardest day on campus? Yeah, actually, you know what? One of the hardest days on campus was easily um, like one of the days after I had knee surgery in my first year. I had knee surgery in my first year and uh, um, we were required to come back over to the, we were required to come over to the gym and it was a, like a actual like we had to be there injured or not and i was just like i was probably like three weeks uh, maybe two weeks fresh out of surgery so still on a little bit of drugs on crutches it was only two weeks on crutches and i had to do eight weeks on crutches and like going over to the gym in in uh in march was, was brutal so i mean that, that was a hard time for me because i mean i i not many people knew, but I, I shed some tears, man, because I was like, I had high dreams to like be able to play pro and do a whole bunch of stuff. And uh, having knee surgery, I'm like, oh my gosh, my career is over, blah, blah, blah. But uh, now that I look back on it, 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 it made me a little bit more resilient. It made me tough. So uh, um, definitely in my first year after surgery, hands down the hardest time um, for me at Cleveland State. And how long did it take for you to trust your body again after surgery? Oh, goodness gracious. It took easily like seven or eight months. It wasn't, it, you know, it's when you have a, an injury that's within your, anything in your knees, your ankle, Achilles, um, sometimes even your back. Um, you take for granted, man, how, how your body functions, right? And uh, one injury could could set you back a whole year or so and, and, it, and it plays on your mind and, and things that you thought you things that you used to do that you want to do now uh might feel different or in your head it feels different so uh easily seven or eight months it was it was a challenge and it might even go even longer than that because i know about a year and a half later i still wasn't doing certain things with my right leg with my with that same injured knee right Right. Um, it wasn't until I actually got to like my third year, I felt comfortable to actually do leg workouts. And uh, that's when I was like, okay, I think my legs completely healed. So, uh, yeah. Yeah. Ha, you're bringing up some memories, man. Holy. <laughs> and when you played your last college game, what was that feeling like? Yeah, that's a, it's an interesting feeling. It's like a, it's like a sad feeling, but a joyful feeling at the same time. You know, you've been a part of this, this family or this team for the last four years. You've been on your own away from home for the last four years and you 
just now recently developed like you understand like a little bit of adulthood like you're like whoa um and you're also happy at the fact that like you know like school's done you don't have to do any more schoolwork um but uh it's it's there's a lot of unknown too right like you don't know what's next um and i i always say it to my young guys today like being in university, playing sport in university, you're like, you essentially have a safety net. Like you're, you have a safety net. Like you don't have to re really worry about the real world. But as soon as you graduate, that safety net is gone. You're out in the real world and you gotta figure it out. And fortunately for me, I, I was able to uh, play basketball overseas for three, four years. Um, so I still had a little bit of that safety net playing overseas and playing pro basketball. but. Um, there, 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 there were times leading up to graduation and even right after graduation where you're just kind of like, what's next? You know, am I going to get a team? Am I going to get an agent? Um, what, what, what country am I going to end up playing in? Um, so yeah, it's, it, that, that part is a huge crossroad, but, uh, I think a lot of people take it in stride and you just kind of, you got to figure it out on the fly. How how good was it or how beneficial was it that you had two younger sisters going through what you went through and you can advise or they can look up to their older brother to ask them, ask them for some advice? That, that's a great question. I think, you know, you asked me just maybe like two or three questions before, prior to this was like, you know, what kept you going? Uh, part of that was my sisters, right? I had two younger sisters. We were all one year apart. Um, and I feel like they were looking up to me because um, from the day that I started playing basketball to this day right now, I mean, they, they still watch my every move and they're like, oh, Patrick's playing basketball. Why can't we play basketball? Now they're playing basketball. Patrick got a scholarship. Why can't we get a scholarship? Okay, they're on a scholarship. So now it's like I have to live up to that guy. Like I have to be that person that sets the standard for the three of us. So. Um, it was a, I don't know if I really felt it that much, but it was just something that was kind of in the back of my head or slightly on my shoulder, but I rarely ever felt it because I had this, uh, I had this joy and passion to play basketball. So, um, for me, it was just like, okay, just continue on, just continue on, just continue on. And then as I got older and I got more comfortable at Cleveland State, I started to like really help my sisters with their transition into uh, university. And, uh, it became, I think we even got closer um, as siblings doing basketball at the NCAA level in separate states, um, but always communicating through cell phone or through email or whatever the case was back then. So, yeah. And um, when you first started playing basketball and your sister started to play basketball as well, what was that, that like? Did you, was there any... Um, like animosity towards them being your younger siblings playing basketball? Did you ever hate on their game or anything because they were women? No, no, not at all. I actually embraced it. Uh, it's funny because um, my sisters only got into basketball because I was actually playing with the Scarborough Hurricanes with Mike Cummings and Rudy Brooker and uh, going on trips to Ottawa and Kingston and Montreal and Niagara Falls and my sisters are coming on the trips and they're staying in hotels or sometimes they're not always getting to come so the first few trips that I went on they never came and my parents just said ah oh, Patrick's going away for basketball then they came on one trip and they stayed in the hotel and they're like we want to do this and then before you know it, it was like geez all three of them are playing basketball so uh it was it was always love man and as as we both as all three of us continued through it, I started to really try to train my sisters and I tried to coach them. And that's when I was like, whoa, I actually like coaching. I even coached them at like the three on three hoop it up. Um, and like, I'm just like, you guys suck. And I'm just like, whoa. <laughs> uh, but uh, uh, yeah, my sisters, man, they, they loved it because I was in it. And uh, um the love was real because if I saw something, then I would tell them like, Hey, you guys got to be better here, here. And we were, again, I'm using the word fortunate, but my dad 
was, uh, was a big supporter of sports. So he went out and got a camcorder. And, and when he got the camcorder back in the day, it was camcorder. I don't even know what they call them now, but uh, um, I had to record my sister's games in, at high school. And then when I had a game after the girls game, my sisters had to record my games. And now we're coming home and on the weekends, we're just watching each other's game. And we're like, you, know, you could have done that. Or why didn't you shoot it here? And now we're just teaching each other and learning off of each other. And like, you know, just sharpening each other's uh, game. And uh, I think that went on and on and on from like grade 10, 11, 12, all the way to just the other day when my sisters were playing in the Olympic. So um, it's kind of weird to think about that right now, but yeah, it's pretty cool. And who was more dominant, you in your sports and you in like men's basketball in high school or your sisters? Me in high school, my sisters post university. My sisters at post university, uh, well, even in university, my youngest sister, Alicia, played, she did it all. She won like one of the first bronze medals for Canada for age group girls. Um, and then my uh, Tamara, who's one year younger than me, who's currently coaching at UFT. Uh, she got on with the university games team and kind of just went from there for the next, I don't know, 11 years uh, with our national team, um, along with Alicia until she tore her ACL. So uh, I really do think my sisters had a, had a they just had a different uh, step to them in the women's basketball game post university because they were athletic and because um, they were so mobile and they could do so many things. Um, once you start to get higher and higher in the men's game, it becomes harder and harder uh, because the, the athletes are elite um, and then you have to specialize in certain things. So um, I thought that I was probably really good in high school and then I got to university, pretty good. But after that, it was like, what? Forget it. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> and after high school and after university, when, what was that feeling like to know that you're not going to play another basketball game professionally? Uh, yeah, that's, a, again, that's another one of those, like, you get to that crossroads that I was just talking about when you're done university and you're like, oh, what's next? Then you get to play pro ball, but then you're done pro ball. That's a, that in itself is that small transition where you're trying to figure out what's your next career, right? And um, I know guys to this day, um, just some local friends um, that I used to play basketball with here in Toronto that are just, right now are trying to figure out what's next, you know? And it's hard because you – um, I talk a lot about this with my with my young guys right now at Mac. Like, when you play basketball, you're making your like you you have this network, and you're creating this network. Especially when you're going to university, you're creating this network wherever you're from. And a lot of us we create this network in in, in Ontario or in Toronto, but then we leave, and the network starts to dwindle down because you're not you're not very like active. You're not socially right. active network so now it starts to shrink and if you're gone too long like my sister was gone for 11 years um really only back for like a month or two in the summers um, a lot of my friends uh, played overseas same deal um, they come back and it's like what do i do what do i do what do i do um, and then they struggle to really figure out what's next you know and um that's uh that's a tough area to be in I think uh, there's there's some programs out there nowadays that help athletes transition from sport to real world or real life careers, but it's it's definitely a struggle. And for me, it was I'm very thankful that I only did it for three four years, and I was still pretty tight with my network. So I I, I was fortunate to hop into uh, coaching right away at Ryerson, and uh, um, that kind of helped me out to be where I am today. And what was that first year coaching at Ryerson like for you? Huh, it was interesting. It was definitely a, a, a huge, huge learning curve. Um, but I was very thankful of the fact that I learned. I kind of was very observant when I was at Cleveland State. 
watching and learning from two, dif two different coaching staffs. Um, both had their own different styles, but both worked extremely hard and they just knew what they were doing. Um, so I kind of drew from certain things and I've always been a person to like save, save, uh, save stuff. So I, I used to save a whole bunch of the stuff that our coaches used to give us and I'd store it and I'd store it and I'd store it and I'd store it and then I'd bring it home. And fortunately for me, when I started at Ryerson, I used some of that stuff to help me at Ryerson and it helped the entire program. Um, and, and that really kind of helped us get the uh, Ryerson program from probably laughing stock in Canada to one of the best programs in, in Canada currently right now. After you played professionally, I remember you saying that you were at Stone Ridge Prep and you said, you said to my brother at the time that there was a seven foot seven player there and Mamadou Injai. I believe his name was. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, how did you end up at Stone Ridge Prep? Um, that was interesting. Again, part of the network, right? I, I feel like, I don't know. I'm, I don't know. The network to me is so important, right? And I feel like, uh, again, going back to Cleveland State, I had the four, I had three guys that were international guys. Of the three international guys, all three of them were uh, one Senegal, two France. The two guys from France ended up going to play pro overseas back in France. And the one guy from Senegal ended up going to California to coach at Stone Ridge Prep. I actually ran into him at the, um, at the Final Four in Indianapolis one year with Jamie McNeely that you just interviewed a couple weeks ago. Um, and uh, he was like, PT, what's up, man? What are you up to? Da -da -da -da. I'm just like. Oh, man, I'm overseas, just kind of waiting right now. But, you know, I'm just trying to figure things out. Like, if I get a contract, I'll go. If I, if I don't, if I can find a coaching gig, I'll stay and do that. Like, oh, man, I might have something for you, man. Da, da, da. And <laughs> kid you not. That was in April. No word of lie. Come September, he was hitting me up. PT, what are you up to, man? You coaching? Are you going overseas? And, like, actually, I'm at home coaching at Ryerson. And then he's like, I got a job for you, man, if you want it. I'm just like, what? He's like, come to California right now. I'll put you up, this and that. You're the head coach for my Stone Ridge Prep team. We had Todd Gibson. We had Ennis Cantor. We had this, this, this. I got a bunch of young African kids that are going to be really good. You got to come coach these guys, man. I'm just like, uh, okay. Just got up and went. Uh, the rest was history, man. I'm, and, you know, I think about it now, and I'm just like, I, I'm glad I did that. I'm glad I took that chance because – some people would be like, no, it's not really my, what I'm trying to do, man. I'm trying to get something stable. And at that time, I was trying to do something stable, but took the chance and it kind of, it helped me. It helped me a lot. So uh, that's exactly how I got the Stone Ridge job, which was pretty cool. But it was part of my network, right? My network from college back in 2003, 4, 5, 6, or 4, 5, 6, 7, got me my job at Stone Ridge Prep in 2000. 10 or 2009. Yeah. What did you learn at Stone Ridge Prep that you use today at McMaster? Oh, wow. That's a good question. That's so long ago. That was like 10, 11 years ago. I feel, uh, you know, one of the things that I really did learn was that uh, I coached nine international kids on that team and they were all new to the country. Right. So, um, I guess one of the biggest things that I learned in that entire season was to have empathy and be very understanding and patient uh, with people that aren't used to the North American way, right? Um, or if I were to put it into my terms today or <coughs> with uh, a group of kids that I might have coached at, at Ryerson, high school kids going to university, they're not used to the work that they have to do academically or on the court um, in university from high school. So you have to be understanding and patient and empathetic to the fact that like, they're going to take some time to understand what's going on. So you can't be getting all crazy and firing off at the head because they don't know what's going on. Right. So um, I think that was probably one of the biggest learning moments for, 
for me from Stone Ridge Prep that I kind of use to this day? Um, after Stone Ridge Prep and after Ryerson, you went on to be an assistant coach in the G League. And what was your experience in the G League like? And do you ever want to go back there? Yeah, it was a great experience. I loved it. Uh, uh, I I say I love it now, but when I was in it, I didn't love it. Um, but when you take time to reflect on what you did and the level that you were at, it's like, wow, that wasn't as bad as I thought it was. But when you're going through it, it's like, whoa. Um, so yes, I would 100% go back to this day. Um, again, I'm grateful out of this world uh, that God even blessed me for that opportunity because I, I was named coach of the year in Canada and, and I, we did something special in 2016 at Ryerson um, and that granted me that opportunity to work with the uh, Boston Celtics affiliate team so why did you um, hate it so much Sorry, my throat was getting dry. Um, All right. Yeah. You know, being in the States is a whole different ballgame when it comes to sport. When you are international. So for myself, I, I think I've probably missed a couple steps here because um, it happened in Cleveland State. But there was, there was no different coaching with the uh, Red Claws. I'm coming in as a Canadian associate head coach, lead assistant coach, versus um, some American guys that are fairly local that have done some stuff in the States. And these guys are looking at it like, this guy is Canadian and he's the lead assistant. Like, this doesn't even... Like, no, so I'm going to try and tear him down. Not not making it obvious, but we'll do our own thing to try to, you know. And I just felt like it was it was like uh, crabs in a in a in a hot pot of water and I was at the top trying to climb out, but there were guys just trying to pull me down, right? So, um, red claws. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh wow, I didn't even do that. Um so, yeah, that was interesting. It was an interesting time. And uh, um, it, at the time, I hated it. And I was like, oh, I don't want to do this. But it was something that I had to do. And I loved it. And it made me better as a coach. So I'm, I'm grateful I stuck it out. So did you, did you see anyone do anything that was detrimental to your career, possibly? No, not necessarily my career, but, uh, you know, <clears throat> I mean, there was a time where, like, I had to have the uh, video scout ready, set. We're going to go upstairs. We're checking into the hotel. We're going to go upstairs, and then we're going to be back downstairs in 45 minutes. And I'm, I set up the film room, the whole nine. Scouts are out. Everything's ready. We go upstairs, come back downstairs in 45 minutes. No video out. The scouts are all missing. Everything's gone. I'm just like, what's going on here? And I asked the lady to lock the door. She locked the door. I watched her. So I only chalked it up like, hey, man, like, obviously one of these guys, one of these assistants were the ones who were doing it. So <clears throat> I let it fly for that, that time. But at that point, I was just like, okay, now I understand what's going on. So the next time I was just like, I'm not going upstairs for the 45 minutes. I'm going to sit right here. Or if it's 90 minutes, I'm going to sit right here and just wait my 90 minutes. I'm not pulling this anymore. So, uh, you, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and and those coaches that were doing that, what, what are they doing now? These guys are coaching Division One basketball. They're coaching on the Boston Celtics. And I'm just like, wow. But again... I'm telling you, this uh, coaching world in the NCAA or G League or NBA, it's, it's very 
Uh, it's very shysty. Um, and you've got, like, it's hard to find good people sometimes, you know? Um, and you need to know the right people or else you can have a very short-lived career um, the higher you climb. What's the perception of Canadians playing basketball, coaching basketball in, in the U.S.? I think uh, the perception is very good. I think it's talented. I think it's hardworking, very smart, somewhat soft at times. But, I mean, you look at today's um, – Look at all the players that we have today in the NBA, and uh, you can't help but think like Jamal Murray, Kelly Olynyk, Andrew Wiggins. Uh, uh, I can't even name on RJ Barrett. Like, there's so many of these guys that are in the league right now, and they're somewhat. Some of them are faces for their program for, for the franchises, and some of them are just very good key pieces, and uh, it just tells you that. Hey, there's something brewing up in Canada, and it's about time, right? So I think there's a very good perception of basketball as a whole in Canada, whether it be coaching, video, strength and conditioning, players, you name it. Um, and I think it's only going to get stronger and better. When I spoke to Juan Mendez, he said that he would be playing in the NBA if he was playing today. Do you feel like you were born too early um, for you to capitalize on your basketball success? Uh, maybe, kind of. It's a hard one to say, uh, you know, because the short end of it was the fact that, like, I was raised a certain way. Like, my parents had no idea of, like, what basketball could do and uh, where it could take you, right? So if my parents were of Canadian descent and they kind of witnessed it this whole time, then maybe it would have been a different story. Uh, but because my parents immigrated, or I should say migrated to uh, Canada, um, even if they were to migrate to Canada, um, Today, it'd still be, um, I think it'd still be the same outcome. I would just be leaning on more people to help me out along my journey, if that makes sense. Right? So, I don't know. That's a good one. I, I couldn't tell you. It's an interesting one, though. What do you love about basketball? Pardon? What do you love about basketball? I don't know. I just love the. Uh, I love. <laughs> what don't I love? I guess uh, competing. Uh, you can play one on one, two on two, three on three. You can get into the gym and shoot. I just love. If I'm shooting by myself, I just love hearing the ball go through the net and swish. Right, you know, just that the sound of the basketball along the hardwood. Just the sound of your shoes screeching on the floor if you're by yourself in the gym. Like it's, there's so many things, man. I, I just, it's the best sport in my in my eyes. And uh, um, <laughs> I don't know. Hopefully, my son loves it as much as I love it. <laughs> and what do you hate about basketball? Pardon? What do you hate about basketball? Ah, that's a good one. I think you know. I, I, the, probably the only thing that I do might I might hate is uh, just the the way others uh, carry on around it. When, when I talk about coaching or trying to pull people down or um, the slippery, uh, I I guess I can call it slippery shadiness of like uh, people saying that I coached that guy or I got this guy there or, you know, I helped him get uh, I, don't, I, don't, I don't know. I don't, I'm just not a fan of that. Like, hey, man, it's just sweet to be a part of any sort of journey. So, um, yeah. Being a, being a university coach, do you see a lot of, a lot of, 
I don't want to say a lot of trainers, but do you see a lot of people say, I, I made that kid who he is? Yeah. Yeah, totally. And you know what? It, it, it's, it's okay. I mean, if that's, some people have it like that, then they have it like that. It's never for me to really judge and kind of look at anybody a certain way. It's just, it is what it is. And I, I'm, I'm, I'm just fortunate enough to even have a position to be able to coach 12 to 15 young men and teach them basketball, um, life skills, and help them graduate. So some people, they got it, they got it the wrong way, but um, sometimes you just can't control that stuff, you know? Um, uh, what type of father are you? Father, oh, goodness gracious. I feel like I'm a, a fun but super, super strict father. <laughs> I don't know, man. But I don't know how super strict I am if my children are four and two. So, uh, But uh, as of right now, currently, I think in the stage that – my kids are at. I'm uh, uh, very playful. Um, I'm like I'm like the I'm like the household toy. Like my kids just always want to play, and it's like, hey, honestly, like daddy's tired. Like let's just lay down and watch TV. Well, I've already started the last eight months of just playing, playing, playing. So now it's like, daddy, let's play. Daddy, let's play. So. Um, yeah, I feel like I'm the household toy right now for my kids, but I wouldn't trade it in for anything, man. I, I love it. So, uh, um, again, very giving. I think I spoil my kids with treats way too much. Uh, uh, but, again, like I said to you earlier, I'd probably take this shirt off my back to to do it, to do whatever I need to do for my kids or I'd protect them as much as I have to. Uh, so, yeah. Um, and what advice do you have for people with kids or people about to have kids? Wow. Um, I never really thought about that. I think kids are so developing. They develop literally every five, six, seven days, right? Like you can have like, have a 15 month old child and they might be doing one thing today and in four days you're going to be like, Oh, how did, when did you, what? Yeah. You know what I mean? So, uh, I feel like, uh, advice to, uh, future parents that are about to have children, like embrace it and enjoy every step, you know, like, so there's days where like, you're just like, just go to sleep do this, do that, you need to sleep. I want to sleep, you sleep. But it's like, at some point in time, they're gonna grow out of that stage too, and it's gonna be like, they're gonna be able to sleep, but you just gotta enjoy every step and embrace it because uh, uh, before you know it, they're gonna be old enough where they can talk back to you or old enough where they can listen to you, you know? So, and then for current parents, I mean, I don't know, it's, it's so hard, like I, I try my best to not give too much advice to current parents because everybody has their own style. You know what I mean? So it's like, Hey, whatever you do, you do. But like, now nah, if you're obviously if you're struggling and you, and you have some uh, issues being a, a, a parent that can provide, then I think I'll, I'd intervene and say, Hey, you know, like you can do this or you should try this or whatever the case may be, you know, but I try my best to leave my bias out of it and let everybody do their own own thing until something's asked of me, I guess. Do you think you've made any mistakes so far as a parent? Oh, geez. Ah, uh, goodness. I don't know. That's a good one. <laughs> I don't know. Honestly, I couldn't tell you. I think, uh, you know, you think about some mistakes 
Um, and I don't know if, like, was it a mistake for me to go on a trip to Brazil or was it a mistake for me to go on a trip to Argentina? Um, maybe, but it, uh, it's also helping me to build a profile to hopefully one day provide for my family at a high level, right? Um, but so far, I don't know, I don't think I've made, I don't know, I, I couldn't tell you that. That one's a tough one, I couldn't tell you. That's a hard one to say right now. Um, and one that was a fairly close mistake was like going, I was uh, selected to go to, um, I forgot the country. We were supposed to go to some country for a uh, national team. As I just literally got the job as an assistant to coach for the cadet team, um, U16, U17. And uh, so you have to, like, you, you're here for two years. Oh, I'm having a son. Um, and it's actually right when we're supposed to leave, so I don't think I'm going to be able to go. We're going to have to cut you. And it's like, for my son? Come on, man. Like, let me just, you know, have my son and then come out later. Um, so I'm glad I didn't make that mistake by missing out the birth of my son. And I don't think I'd ever miss the birth of my children, but that was a close one. Um, and uh, um, I'm just, I guess I'm, I'm thankful that I didn't put my career before uh, family. And what advice do you use from your parents on your children? What advice do I use for them? Yeah. Oof. Like, is wow. there anything that you, that, that your parents used to tell you growing up that you use today as a parent? Um, I have a couple still in my back pocket that I'm going to use with them eventually. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but currently right now at the stage that they're at, I think, uh, um, between my wife and I, we're just literally trying to teach them how to be kind and how to be thankful and how to, you know, um, have manners. Um, you know, like currently my daughter's in um, like a like a daycare um, elementary school. It's like a combined kind of thing. So she has, and now she's getting to the stage where she's meeting kids that are um that have a disability right whether it be uh, anxiety or it could be uh, bipolar or whatever the case is right she's meeting kids her age that are like not like her and then she's coming home and you know so and so doesn't say anything or so and so did this and so oh that's not like the behavior of a kid that is you know special needs and uh, now it's more about us trying to manage and tell her like you should always say hi and you should always say you know you know would you like to play at least offer and just small acts of kindness right right um, i think that goes a long way because if you can embed that from an early age then um that'll that'll walk with her and and my son for a lifetime does anything scare you about raising a, a black woman and a black man? A future black woman and a future black man? Yeah. You know, uh, I think I'm optimistic though because of what's going on right now in the world. You hope that there is change and uh, you just hope to God that, uh, what we're going through right now is only going to benefit um, my children, your children, you know, like 15, 20, 25 years from now, right? And I think that's why um, you, you're seeing a lot, a lot of people um, advocate and talk about Black Lives Matter and um, systemic racism now and how much we have to kind of, uh, you know, just squeeze that out or try to extract it from society because, like, we, I don't want my children going through uh, systemic 
injustices. Like I don't, I don't want that for my children, right? So um, it's a little scary, but I'm optimistic that in 20 years, when she's 24, that things aren't as bad. Um, or in 20 years, when my son is 22, that it's not as embedded into the into society as it is right now so i'm i'm hopeful were you scared to become a father or excited man i was so thrilled <laughs> oh man i've been talking about kids since i was like 20 years old um i've always been a i've always been a i guess you can say jovial kind of guy and I like to laugh and have fun um, but I've always wanted to have my own kids so as soon as my wife and I got married in 2014 we were like let's go um, and uh, uh, we had our one one baby girl in 2016 and then our son in 2018 so um, and hey yeah, you never know. I'd like to get a couple more. <laughs> yes, God willing. Now, what type I of love husband? Kids, man. I could tell. Oh, and um, I heard you mention in another interview that your day usually starts off with Pepper Pig. And um, what's your favorite kids' cartoon that you watch with your children? Ah, gosh. Hey, right now it's Peppa Pig. There's no if ands and maybe's. I think I know every single episode. I'm like <laughs> Peppa Pig's on repeat. Oh gosh, I find myself humming some of the like, you know, the transition song from like one scene to the next. I'm just like, how do I know that? Like, you know what I mean? Uh, my son's really much so into uh, Paw Patrol right now, so that's another household favorite. And uh, uh, between the two of those, I mean. Those two are pretty much on repeat right now. And then if there was a movie, they'd like Angry Birds and Boss Baby. So it's, it's fun times and uh, I'm, I'm so into it. So I'm okay with it. And what type of husband are you? Oh, my wife wouldn't say I'm a really great husband, but I think I'm fairly decent. <laughs> she wouldn't say I'm great because I'm so busy with basketball, right? I'm a... Uh, I'm uh, always, always, always busy with basketball. Um, and it's just hard. I think I listen to podcasts sometimes um, of other coaches, and I think some of the other coaches I hear and I listen, and you know, they've had some really good success, in, like at the NBA level or the NCAA level. But you know, a lot of them talk about balance and really understanding how to balance basketball and family life and you know how much can you be obsessed with the basketball but then give that same obsession with your family right so um me as a husband i mean i just try my best to make sure that i not only cater to my wife but also try to help her out where where we need to when it comes to our kids um, and just trying to keep our marriage intact. So uh, we are, what is this now, 2020, six years strong. Um, Congratulations. Thank you. So uh, we're just uh, plugging along and just seeing where the, uh, where the journey takes us, to be honest with you. And how did you meet your wife? Through basketball, what? Wow. Uh, uh, I actually I was coaching young girls before and then our young girls were playing against some older girls which my wife was playing against the young girls and I was like whoa who's that and I think I Facebook stopped her uh, messaged her and I guess you know worked a little bit of magic to grind a couple of dates and here we are now Six years of marriage, two kids, and enjoying life, I guess. And how much does she? How much does she mean to you? Um, like what? 
what would your life be without her? Oh my goodness, it'd be a mess. It'd be a complete mess. <laughs> what? Man, when I was at Ryerson, when I was at Ryerson, I was driving like some, just some random car I was sharing with my sister. Uh, my wife really, like she had a tight hold on like what she was doing, which was teaching. Um, and she was, and I was living at home. She was living on her own, uh, had her own car. Like she just had her stuff intact, right? Um, so, I mean, she's taught me a ton, man. Like uh, I'm, I've literally evolved because of her. Um, uh, so uh, I don't know where I'd be right now without her. Like I'd probably be in a box with, um, Red, a bottle of red wine, watching basketball, looking at pro line tickets, <laughs> <laughs> eating chips or something like that. So uh, I'm so grateful, man. I don't think you understand. Like she may not even understand because the, right now the times that we're going through are hard. Not hard. It's just uh, it's always challenging every other day because you're at home. Um, there's a lot of job uncertainty for. Um, different people myself included um but you're also you're also raising two kids under four and that could be a challenge in itself uh so um yeah she's i don't know where i'd be without her there's no doubt what is success to you what's your definition of success wow uh, we did this in college once and I forgot what our definition of success was um, as a team. But to me, I don't know. I feel like it's more about like, you know, being able to accomplish goals that you set out for yourself. So like, again, I've had numerous goals and some of those goals were to play basketball, I was able to do that at an NCAA level, play overseas, okay, great. I ticked that off. Okay, I wanna be able to coach, great, I'm coaching right now. I wanna get married, boom. Uh, have kids, yes. Have a house, yes. Right, like those things have been goals, but I feel like when you're able to attain some of those goals, um, but also help people along the way uh, to learn about themselves or discover what they can do, that, that's pretty uh, special at the same time. So I think that's why I got into coaching is to really kind of give and give and give. Um, and uh, part of the success for me is just being able to give to young student athletes that might not be able to get somewhere else or wouldn't be able to learn um, if they were not playing basketball. Uh, so, I mean, yeah, success, success, man, is just, for me, it's just being able to help others and, but at the same time, obtain, attaining some of your goals that you've, you've, you've laid out to accomplish in your life. So, I'm very thankful of that. And are you where you want to be in life right now? I, am I where I want to be in life right now? 1,000%. I wouldn't change it for anything. I'm exactly where I need to be. Um, and I think that's more so because, again, I got a pretty strong uh, faith. And I, I think where I am right now is because God has me here, man. It's just where I need to be um, right currently. Right? And I'm still got 20 more years. And uh, I still got some other goals to obtain or attain. So I'm, I'm looking forward to those goals. But it, at the time being right now, I'm, I'm content where I'm at and uh, just continuing to uh, keep the faith and work hard. How much does your faith mean to you? Like how much is it who you are? It's a, it's a good chunk. I don't, I, I don't think, I don't, I don't know if I walk around and showcase it for many, but I think it's it's something that's within me that I, I just really know. And the people that are really close to me um, will know that like 
a, a, a he really leans on God for a lot. Um, and I think it's a, it's, it's a fairly good part of me, man. Like our family, we, we do church on Sundays. And if we don't do church on Sundays, then we try to do it online, which we've been doing for COVID. Um, so, um, it's a good piece of me. And tell me why you love Kevin Garnett. Oh, you did some digging, eh? <laughs> uh, I don't know. I think, you know, KG is, uh, is a he's an animal, man. He's a beast. He, he's just so, so, so enthusiastic and so hungry. Um, and I just love his intensity. I, I, I wore number 21 my entire career because of KG. And I thought, you know, um, I would carry myself just like him. Uh, um, this just this destructive, hardworking animal on the court, but then off the court, he's just as intense, but very, very loving, right? So, uh, and I feel like you know that, that's kind of who I am. I, I get after my guys, whether it's in coaching or when it was time to play, I'd get after it. But off the court, I'm easygoing, love to have fun, and. Uh, um, again, very giving. Is there any um, strong held basketball techniques or training practices that you find to be useless or um, terrible to player development? Um, that's a good one. I don't know. I, I I've used uh, not used. I think. I don't know. I, that's a that's a hard one to answer. That's a really that's you're stumping me on that one. I think I don't think there's many that are really bad for basketball. I think uh, as in, as a young um, student of the game, you just gotta develop as much as you possibly can. And I mean, just having the the fundamentals in that core base, just that small small foundation of just learning how to uh, jump and run and dribble and pass and shoot. Like just learning all those little things, great. And however you do it, that's completely up to you. But I do think that it's needed. Um, but as you get older, I mean, there's some things that you just don't really need to do. Um, and as you transition from, I don't know, elementary school to secondary school, you, 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 you kind of do the same things. But once you get to secondary school and you're transitioning from secondary school to university, it becomes a new ball game. It becomes like, you know, you've got to really almost um, see yourself in this scenario so that you can actually translate it on the court. Um, and then when you get to the college level and you're transitioning that to pro, it becomes a whole nother ball game of more like just being super comfortable in what you do, but also, um, um, really really confident and understanding like if it's up to me it's gonna have to be up to me and i gotta do it so um you just gotta be super super confident i think that's one thing that uh um professional basketball players have um, that are playing in the nba or playing overseas like they you know they're confident uh, now you just gotta hope that you're not super arrogant about it but yeah but i don't think there's anything that you can't use. And the last question I have is, how do you want to be remembered? Uh, as a giver, as somebody that got up and gave everything every day, whether it was my energy, my feedback, my advice, um, my last dollar. Um, just somebody that just constantly was willing to give. Um, if, if, if I could be remembered for uh, that, then that'd be amazing because I don't think there's any anything else that's better than just, you know, 
giving outside of yourself, right? Like a lot of many people today, I mean, just in general, we all want to try to get done for me, 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 or my family, 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 but it's very hard to come out, come outside of that and try to give for others and uh, um, not necessarily just overlooking your family, but, you know, just taking on that extra piece of like, oh, you know what, that person needs a little bit of help, let me give to them. You know, that person or that family needs this, I have, so I might as well give, right? So I'm, I don't know, that's just been me, that's been my whole thing, and I think I've watched it in my dad um, my entire life. He gives, like, no other. Uh, people could be coming over just to drop off some mail, and he's like, hey, you want some food? I have food made. You want to have a bite? You know, it's just like, man, you don't have to give our dinner away, but uh, it's it's about, uh, it's just how I've been raised, man, just to want to give to others. So, yeah, remember as a giver, uh, I think I'd take that any day of the week. Thank you so much for allowing me to interview you. It means a lot. Uh, man, I appreciate it, Jalil. Like, again, I'm so grateful that you even asked me. Um, hopefully, there are a few things you guys could have got out of it, but we'll see. Got a whole lot. Thank you.